Thank you very much. And I will do my best to get through in the shortest talk I've ever given, seven minutes. Um, so here's a table of contents about what I'd like to cover. Um, we, are, we have initiated a randomized clinical trial in Boston at the Brigham of two drugs, uh, pyridostigmine and low-dose naltrexone alone or in combination against placebo. And I'll tell you more about that. And, but first, I wanted to give you a little bit of the justification uh, for doing so. Yesterday, I briefly presented um, a randomized clinical trial that we did with pyridostigmine with invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing that showed, we think, a proof of concept that at least one uh, beneficial mechanism in our patients with ME is to improve preload, uh, which is what we demonstrated in a randomized placebo-controlled study uh, using that modality. Um, and this is what I gave you briefly yesterday as a potential mechanism of action. And I conferred with our neurology colleagues here about mechanisms of action and got approval for this as the likely uh, possibility for improvement in vascular tone during upright cycling exercise with mestinon or pyridostigmine, which is that it acts at the cholinergic step in the sympathetic ganglion, uh, be getting uh, increased sympathetic outflow to the blood vessels, and what we can demonstrate is improved preload. So with that as a potential proof of concept, as least, at least as a partial pathway to exertional intolerance, we think we've justified the use of long-term pyridostigmine or mestinon in our study. Uh, the other drug that we are using is uh, largely borrowed from our Scandinavian colleagues, where I learned all about it. Uh, it's low-dose naltrexone, which is probably pleiotropic in its, uh, its use uh, and its efficacy. Uh, it's known to be a mu uh, opioid receptor antagonist. It's used in higher doses, about 10 times the doses that we're using in ME and long COVID uh, for alcohol and opiate use disorders. Uh, it's known uh, that it restores natural killer cell function, so I'm fascinated to see some of the work going on with uh, plasma cells and the relationship to natural killer cells, so potentially this is one additional mechanism. Uh, it, we heard from Dr. Cash a minute ago about the NF-kappa-B pathway that elicits pro-inflammatory cytokines, the inflammasome. Uh, and we know that uh, low-dose naltrexone antagonizes that inflammatory pathway. There is precious little in the way of randomized clinical trials. In fact, I think none, um, and that's justifying our study, but there are some glimmers of hope uh, from the related fibromyalgia where there's improvement in pain with LD and low-dose naltrexone, and there's also some uh, data out of Finland that suggests an MECFS uh, self-reported symptoms are improved. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you further justification for the use of these two drugs in our randomized clinical trial with what we call baby lift. It's sort of tongue-in-cheek. Uh, it is a retrospective study of patients with ME treated with these drugs either alone or in combination versus neither followed over about a year in the clinic uh, with a special test that I mentioned yesterday very briefly, but we'll revisit here if that's okay. Uh, it's called the SHAPE test. This is a very simple uh, point of care administered cardiopulmonary exercise test. There are no catheters involved uh, happily, uh, but there is a metabolic cart similar to the invasive CPET uh, shown here, and uh, these are our exercise physiologists at work, these are not patients. It's self-paced, uh, it's three minutes of stepping. Uh, there is a handle to hold on for anybody with orthostatic intolerance, and there's a metabolic cart that gives us um, all the same variables, essentially, although during constant workload that the invasive or the non-invasive cycling test gives us. So this is one of our modalities that I wanted to show you from the baby lift, and we have incorporated it into the major randomized clinical trial that I'm about to show you. So here are some data. These patients were all MECFS. Uh, they were followed over a year in the clinic with replicate shape tests, the one I just showed you. Uh, over here is the combination of LDN 
and pyridostigmine, and that was one of our larger groups. You can see the N here. And the outcome variable that I focused on here is a time-honored marker of cardiovascular fitness, uh, ability to exercise, or reflects parasympathetic tone or vagal tone. Uh, it's heart rate recovery. So when one stops exercise, look at how fast the heart rate decays over the first minute, and the faster it decays, the more parasympathetic tone, the healthier you are. So what we can see is improvement in the group that got both drugs over here. We have too few with LDN monotherapy, but we have more coming. I'll tell you more about that at another date. And then here's mestinon or pyridostigmine monotherapy with 75 patients improved. Note over here, patients who get neither drug, uh, and this is uh, one of the pitfalls of a retrospective study, uh, were, had better heart rate recovery both at baseline and it didn't change much uh, over a period of observation. These were likely healthier folks who didn't get drugs. So here's our study that we're doing now called the LIFT study, justified by the things I think that I just gave you. Uh, this is a randomized clinical trial, single center, but it's a large one for a single center at the Brigham, and we are comparing, as I mentioned, pyridostigmine in combination with LDN versus pyridostigmine alone versus LDN alone versus a placebo arm. Uh, 40 patients in each group um, and uh, one to one to one uh, to one randomization. Uh, there, this looks complicated, but uh, this is our dosing regimen. We do what we've done in the clinic, which is escalate over a couple of weeks to the final doses, which are shown here. Uh, and I've been asked uh, previously, what, what do we use? I borrowed this from others. Uh, we, we target, whoops, sorry. We target um, uh, 60 uh, milligrams of pyridostigmine three times a day and the active treatment arms, and we target ultimately LDN 4.5 milligrams once in the morning uh, as the treatment arm. We have the ability to de-escalate the dosing uh, in, a, in a blinded fashion if patients have side effects. Uh, the outcome variables that we're measuring in addition to that shape test that I mentioned a second ago are these. One is a wearable device, this is the Garmin Vivo Smart which is purported to uh, give us a variety of physiologic variables that we will look at continuously over the three-month trial. And then we have a bunch of omics with, a, with several collaborators. Some of these centers you'll recognize. I would add transcript omics, which isn't shown here. And then we have well-validated questionnaires that are administered, stored in REDCap, uh, and a special nod to Dr. Sommerfeld, who helped us with uh, this one here. So um, questionnaires, uh, uh, biomarker, physiologic biomarkers, including the wearable device and replicate shape tests are our outcomes. We are about a quarter of the way into enrollment. It's going to take a little while, a single center, uh, but I hope to be able to tell you more perhaps in a year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your precise talk and for making up some time. Um, is there any, are there any questions from the audience? Um, up there, okay. Thanks. Um, since pyridostigmine can decrease the heart rate, um, do you have any lower limit which you um, set for including patients, or how do you deal with this? Um, you know, us usually, uh, resting heart rates by day are not substantively affected, uh, but I have an occasional patient always wearing a wearable device who tells me, uh, my heart rate went to 40 last night during my sleep. So th if there are symptoms associated with that, uh, we could list that as a serious adverse effect and discontinue the study. So that is written in. But uh, de facto, uh, none of our patients has any cardiovascular disease. They're excluded up front. So I don't think it's a practical issue. But thanks for that question. David, a theoretical question here. There we go. Yeah. 
What would happen if you will give mestinone to a healthy subject? Let's suppose, let's suppose myself. Will I improve my physical uh, performances? Or if I'm a sport person, can it be used to improve uh, achievements? Good question. I mean, we think the mechanisms of action are on the autonomic nervous system that is out of kilter in ME and long COVID. Um, and we think, uh, in part, it may be LDN-like and that uh, ongoing uh, parasympathetic tone, which is begat by uh, mestinon and the increase to, of acetylcholine, may actually be anti-inflammatory over time. So I'm not certain that um, there would be huge overlap with a healthy athlete, but I, I shouldn't you never say never in this business. There certain are, certainly are aerobic athletes with orthostatic intolerance, um, perhaps uh, improvement there. And then, of course, this group knows about inflammation and recovery from exercise, so maybe. And it will not cause diarrhea to counteract that shit? Yeah. So uh, I should, uh, <laughs> good question. So the nuisance side effects are, in fact, diarrhea and muscle cramps. They're usually early in the treatment with mestinon. They usually go away and don't require a dose reduction, and we treat them symptomatically briefly. Thank you very much. I think if there are not any more questions, we will continue, and thank you for your thank talk. You.